Well, I thought for a moment I might have to reintroduce myself to Brother Andy, but he did an excellent job, didn't he? At least as far as I'm concerned. I appreciate his kind remarks and what a blessing it is for my wife and I and our daughter Veda to be with you this evening. I wished I could have been here during these last few days. I know the quality of men that have spoken from this pulpit. I also know that the icing on the cake had to be for you ladies to have Sister Collie here yesterday, but we're thankful for the privilege at least to share in this particular hour with you tonight, not only in involved in a Bible study period, but likewise to sing praises to our God and also to go to Him in prayer. Wonderful conclusion to the Lord's day. And I'll give you one other th thought, and that is that it is a blessing to be here tonight because we see Sister Winnie Holloway tonight. Sister Winnie Holloway was a member of our congregation for a number of years, and we became very close to her and uh, it's a pleasure to be able to see her tonight, and I know you all are taking good care of her. It was a decision that she needed to make to come back home and to be close to family, but we love seeing her tonight. But I'm grateful to the elders of this congregation and to Brother Andy for the kind invitation. When the history of the world has been written, surely five great days will stand out above all others. One would have to be that day when Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. The Savior had come into the world. The second great day, in my judgment, would have to be some 33 years later when at the end of his public ministry, Jesus Christ would go up Calvary's hill and there he would die for the sins of man. The third greatest day would have to be that third day after his death on the cross when he arose triumphantly from the tomb and thus secured our own resurrection one day. He said, because he lives, we shall live also. And then a fourth great day would have to be some 50 days after his resurrection, that first Pentecost after his resurrection when the church of our Lord was established and on that day some 3,000 souls were baptized into Christ and thus baptized into the body of Christ, the church. That fifth great day, however, is still future. It will be the greatest of all days. It will be the final day, and that is the day when Jesus comes again. Christians are interested in those things that are eternal in nature. And while there may be very few giving thought this evening to the idea of Jesus coming again, we in this room are interested in it. And we know that our Lord will come again. And the entirety of our focus while we're here upon this earth ought to be preparation for that great day. In Matthew 25, beginning in verse 31, notice the words of Jesus. He's speaking of himself when he says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left." The day under consideration is the day when Jesus comes again. And you will notice that the one who will sit in judgment is Jesus Christ himself. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, he will do what? Sit upon the throne of his glory. And all the nations of the earth will be gathered before him. Now when he comes again, he is not coming inconspicuously. For every eye shall see him. Revelation 1, 7. When he comes again, he will be accompanied not just by one or two angels or a few angels or some angels, but the entire heavenly host. For the text says he will come with all his holy angels. 
And so for a brief moment the heavenly city shall be emptied, save God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ will descend in a blaze of glory, and accompanying him will be his angels who are like him in character. For the text says he will come with all his holy angels. What a sight to behold when Jesus comes again. Now when Jesus comes again, we need to understand that on that day, all the people who have ever lived will be assembled before him. For in 2 Timothy 4.1, we learn that the quick and the dead, the alive and the dead shall be there. Of course, there will be billions who have already died and gone on. They will be raised from the dead. There will still be those living here on this earth when Jesus comes again. In fact, Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians, or rather 1 Thessalonians 4, that uh, when Jesus comes again, those who sleep in Jesus, or those who are still alive, will not precede those which sleep in Jesus. They too will be raised, and so we shall all stand before him in judgment. The dead, small and great. Revelation 20 uh, and 1, 20 and 12 will be there. The dead, small and great. And so when we consider how man uh, classifies greatness, we understand that that may be different the way God classifies greatness. We understand that when... when uh, the dead, small and great, will stand before Christ in judgment, that that uh, includes all people. Now, there could be someone who has cut himself off from society. Somebody who says, well, uh, uh, I don't want to be surrounded by people any longer. That person goes into a wilderness. He's never seen by anybody again. He dies out in the wilderness alone. And yet we know that that individual will not escape the judgment, will he? And yet at the same time, those who have been considered great by mankind will not escape the judgment. All of the uh, presidents and emperors and military generals, all the great celebrity figures, all those who have been known in education and fields of business, they will all stand before the Lord Jesus Christ to be judged. And so he will judge the quick and the dead. He will judge the dead, small and great. And likewise, uh, when he judges uh, the dead, small and great, it will be good for us to remember that uh, all those, no matter how honored they have been by man, will still be judged by how they have honored God. This, this past week, you perhaps recall hearing the uh, announcement that the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth II, celebrated her 90th birthday. Most of us in this room probably cannot remember a time when she wasn't the Queen. That's how long she's been reigning. In fact, uh, just a year or two ago, she surpassed her great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, as far as longevity on the throne, 63 years. But speaking of that great-great-grandmother, Queen Victoria, who reigned during the 19th century, an era that's known for her, the Victorian era, it is said that Queen Victoria, one who no doubt entered Westminster Abbey to the strains of God Save the Queen many times, that whenever she heard the hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, either sung or played, she would take off her crown and set it aside in deference to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Well, I like that because indeed every, every king and queen that's ever reigned upon any earthly throne will have to pay homage to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus the Christ. In fact, no one will escape the judgment because in Acts 17, 30 and 31, we read the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance that he hath raised him from the dead. And so in that particular text, we learn that the entire world will stand before Christ in judgment. But if there is still some doubt in the minds of some individuals, 
as to who shall stand before Christ in judgment. And just in case there are some who perhaps believe that they will not have to stand before him, that somehow they will miss the judgment, listen to 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So, we notice in this particular passage that we must all appear before the throne of Christ that everyone may give an account. And so it is true to, when we say that everybody will stand before Christ in judgment and therefore we will not be alone on the judgment day. It is also right for us to consider this. It will be like we are alone on the judgment day. Everybody will be there, but when we're judged, we're going to be judged individually. For the text in 2 Corinthians 5.10 says that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You suppose somebody says, well, I'm sure I'm going to be saved because I live in America and there are more churches in America than anywhere else in the world. Don't expect to use that on the day of judgment. In fact, when you stand before Christ in judgment, you cannot say, well, Lord, I wasn't a Christian. I never obeyed the gospel. I wasn't a member of the church of Christ. But my wife and my children, or my husband and my children, they were faithful members of the church. So surely I can't be lost. You've got to let me in too. Will the Lord turn to that person and say, well, I hadn't considered that. Come on in. No, we're going to be judged individually. And on that particular day, when we are judged individually, we need to understand that some books will be opened. Some books will be opened. Revelation 21, 27, the Lamb's book of life will be opened on that particular day. And your name and my name must be found recorded in the Lamb's book of life. But not only will the Lamb's book of life be open on that day, this book from which we are studying tonight and which you've been studying here over the last few days and from which you regularly study, it's going to be open. For Jesus said, John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. And so on that day we stand before Christ in judgment. This book, the Holy Bible, will be opened and we shall be judged from this book. Now we need to understand, we're free moral agents. We make up our own minds whether or not we're going to accept Christ or reject him. We can come to him on his terms or we can turn our back on him. But we need to know this. While no one, including the Lord, will force any one of us to follow him, we will still be judged by the Bible on the last day. For example, a person doesn't have to put his faith in Jesus Christ, but he needs to know this. He's going to have to face the Bible one day. Somebody says, I don't want to repent. Well, nobody's going to make you repent, but you'll still have to face God's word that teaches you and me to repent. Somebody says, well, I don't care anything about being baptized. Then don't be baptized. But Mark 16, 16 will still be there when you stand before Christ in judgment. And so we're going to be judged from this particular book, God's word, the Bible. It will be the standard on the day of judgment. But then consider also that another book that will be opened on that day is the book that we ourselves are writing. 2 Corinthians 5.10, remember, we will have to give an account of the things that we have done, whether they be good or whether they be bad. That's the book we're presently writing. I know this, when I stand before Christ in judgment, I want to make sure that my record has been cleaned through his precious blood. But you think about standing before Christ outside of him, standing before Christ with everything that you've ever done on your record, how embarrassing it will be, and then to consider the verdict of the Lord as he examines our lives. And so on that particular occasion, when Jesus comes again, we would note that some books will be open, and among those books that will be open, one is the Lamb's Book of Life, and our name must be recorded there. Another book is His Holy Word, and we'll be judged from it. And the third book is the book we're writing, the record of, our, of the deeds of our lives. Now, then we will hear the verdict, will we not? What will the verdict be? Well, we will hear as to whether or not we're going to spend eternity in a place called heaven or a place called hell. Now, I am not sure if everyone who even is religious understands the consequences here. You might ask some people, are you going to heaven? And 
These individuals might say, well, I sure hope so. I'm not sure I will or not. I, I don't know if I ought to, uh, if I should go to heaven or not. I'm not sure that I will. So then you're planning to be in hell. Is that right? Well, no, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen either. I'm just wondering if for many people out there, there, there's this middle ground, you know, not going to heaven. And on the other hand, not going to hell, is there just some place in between? Well, the Bible doesn't teach that, does it? We would study from this particular passage that when the verdict is rendered, there will be two destinations, either heaven or hell, saved or lost, right hand or the left hand. And we determine now where it will be. Now, the verdict. Listen to Matthew 25 and notice uh, verse 34. This is to those on the right hand. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now that's what we want to hear from the Lord. But then notice in verse 41 of Matthew 25, when he says to those on his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I do not know, dear friends, if there could be two passages of Scripture that stand more in contrast with one another than those two passages. Matthew 25, 34 and Matthew 25, 41. What a study in contrast. To one group, Jesus says, come. What blessed words to hear from the lips of our Lord Jesus Christ. You remember on one occasion when the storm was raging on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus walks on the water and uh, the disciples see him and Peter says, Lord, let me come to you. And Jesus says, come, come. He always says that. Come, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Come, take of the water of life freely. Come to me. That's what Jesus is saying. And so here in this passage, he says to those on the right hand, those who are saved, come. But look at the contrast. Verse 41, to those on his left hand, depart. He says, come ye blessed of my father. Depart ye cursed. What a contrast. Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. What a contrast. None like it in all of scripture. And so the verdict will be rendered on the day of judgment, that final day, the day when Jesus comes again. Now we understand that we ought to take this message seriously because we know what's going to happen to this world and to this universe. Second Peter 3, 10, it will be burned up. It will be burned up. There will be nothing left here. That which God spoke into existence out of nothingness will return to a state of nothingness. And all that really is going to matter at that particular time is our souls. That's all that will matter. Where will our souls spend eternity? I want to study hell first and then end on the positive note by studying heaven. Two destinations are laid out there by Jesus. One place, Jesus spoke about it and often, and that is a place of torment called hell. In the last verse of Matthew 25, these shall go away into everlasting punishment. I don't really like to speak on the subject of hell. I don't know that many preachers who do delight in that. I'd much rather talk about the great victory we have in Christ Jesus than to talk about hell. But if one is going to be faithful in his declaration of the gospel, he has to talk about hell. And Jesus talked about the subject quite often. Somebody says, is it, really, is it really right, though, to motivate someone to come to Christ out of fear? Well, I will say this. Our Lord Jesus Christ motivated through fear, didn't he? A fear of being lost. Except ye believe that I am he, you'll die in your sins. John 8, 21. Nay, except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Luke 13, 3. Whosoever will deny me before men, I'll deny before my heavenly Father. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. What is Jesus doing but appealing through fear? Do not lose your soul in this place that is called hell. But someone asked the question, 
Why is hell so bad? I want to tell you something, friends. I don't want to go to this place called hell because I don't like its description. Have you ever considered how hell is described in the Bible? We would note that in Revelation 21, 8, it's described as a lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Does that appeal to you? Revelation 20 and 1, it's likened to a bottomless pit. Matthew 8, 12, it's a place of outer darkness. Now, through those scriptures that I just mentioned, consider what's taking place. There is an appeal made to our minds based upon what we fear. There is a fear that's basic to every human being, a fear of burning, a fear of falling, a fear of the darkness. And so the Bible describes hell in this way. Just picture a pit that has no bottom. Fill it up with fire, but you can't see it. And our Lord says that's a pretty good description of this place called hell. No reasonable person would ever want to spend just a minute in this place of torment. But we're talking about that which is forever. I remember speaking to a family member of mine a number of years ago, someone who'd never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. We had several good Bible studies, and yet he still refused to obey the gospel. And I finally said to him, don't you understand that if you keep refusing the gospel invitation, that one day you will die and be eternally lost in a place called hell? I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, then that's just how it'll have to be. <laughs> a person who says something that, like that is not thinking reasonably. That person is not thinking rationally. I don't want to go to this place called hell because I don't like its description. But likewise, when I consider hell, I do not like its occupants. Who is it that will occupy hell? Revelation 20 and 10, the devil that deceived them will be there. I understand that when we study about our enemy, he is a being that can be transformed into an angel of light. He seems so innocuous. He seems so friendly. He is able to make the things of this world so appealing. They, the, the, the glitter, the glamour you see out there appeals to so many people. And yet if we really want to see what the devil is like, what do we need to do? Just go over to Job chapter 1. You'll get a good picture of the devil. Let the mask come off of him there in Job chapters 1 and 2 and you'll see what your enemy and mine is really like. There we find a being that, will, that does not have any pity whatsoever upon a human being. Jesus himself said that he was a murderer from the very beginning, always a liar and the father of lies. That is not a being that we should desire to follow and it is definitely a being with whom we should desire to be with throughout eternity. I'll tell you, though, the sad thing is this, dear friends. Most people are following that being tonight, are they not? The devil will be there along with the devil's angels. In fact, our text reveals in verse 41 that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Just as our Lord Jesus has, has angels that serve him and they are identified as his holy angels, so it is that the devil likewise has his own angels, those who follow him. Well, we would expect the devil and his angels to be in this place called hell, but I want you to notice in Revelation 21, 8, who else will be in this awful place? The fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and, all, and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, did you notice the people that will be found in this place called hell? Abominable, murderers, homongers, sorcerers, idolaters, liars. But notice how the list begins. It begins with the fearful and the unbelieving shall have their place in the place called hell. I don't want to be in that awful place because I don't like its description. 
And number two, I don't like its occupants. And here's number three, I don't want to be in that place because in hell there are no exits. Once a person is there, he can't get out. You see, a criminal can stand before a judge and hear a verdict. Guilty. And the criminal may be charged with 25 years in prison. With the parole system the way it is, he'll probably get out early. But that criminal can go to prison and after the first day, he can mark off day one and say, now I've got this many days remaining. But a person does not go to this place called hell and mark off day one on the calendar and say, here's, much, here's how much time I have remaining. You see, the text reveals to us in Matthew 25, 46, it is everlasting punishment. Conscientious, conscious punishment throughout all of eternity. And so in hell there are no exits. You recall in Luke 16 that there was a rich man who died and he found himself in this place called torment. Somehow he was able to look over to the other side, a place called Abraham's bosom. And there he saw one named Lazarus. He knew who Lazarus was, though he paid little attention to that poor man during his life. But the rich man begs for Abraham to send Lazarus over, dip his tongue in, or his finger in water, and cool. That rich man says, cool my parched tongue. I'm burning in this torment, he says. Send Lazarus over here to help me. And Abraham says, there's something you've got to understand. You see, Lazarus can't go from here to over where you are any more than you can go from where you are over here to where he is. You see, between us there is a great gulf fixed and there's no going back and forth between those two places. In hell, there are no exits. I don't want to go there. I know you don't want to go there. But let's flip the coin over. There is a place called heaven. And Jesus talks about heaven. In fact, in one of the most beautiful passages, so meaningful to those of us who are Christians, it's these words of Jesus. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Jesus Christ is even now preparing a home for the faithful. Here is something that I heard often as a boy. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people, and it is. You see, according to Matthew 25, 46, these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous, Jesus says, into life eternal. He's talking about heaven. Why is it so um, beautiful a thought to go to heaven? Well, I want to go to heaven for the same reasons I don't want to go to hell. You see, in heaven, I do like its description. I love the description of heaven. I believe that's what we find in the 21st chapter of Revelation. How often at the gravesite of a faithful child of God have we read these words, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things, those things we've endured in this life, the former things shall be passed away. Well, what about the description of heaven? In Revelation 21, we learn that heaven is a very large place. Verse 16 of Revelation 21. The city lieth four square. The length is as large as the breadth. And that tells me there is plenty of room in heaven for all those who are prepared to go there. I have occasionally been traveling after a gospel meeting and, and I think I, 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 I'll leave the 
the meeting and head home thinking I can make it, but I just can't do it. And so I want to stop for the night only to find that I can't find a room. I can go to one particular place and then to another and then to another. No vacancy. No vacancy. I don't expect to get to heaven and find these words, no vacancy. Heaven's a large place. Not only that, heaven is a beautiful place. We notice in verse 18, listen to the description. The building of the wall is of jasper. The city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. Here, what comes to our mind are those precious metals, precious stones that we admire so much here on earth for its beauty. And what John is trying to help us understand is heaven is beyond anything you've ever really imagined. It is so beautiful. Try to think of the most beautiful things on earth, and yet even that doesn't adequately describe it. We sing sometimes, we read of its beauty, but somehow we know its glory has never been told. I heard the story of a little boy who was born blind. When he was about six or seven years old, doctors told his parents, we believe we might be able through a surgical procedure to help that child see. They had nothing to lose. And so it is that they went along with the doctor's advice to have the surgery. When the bandages came off of his eyes, the little boy slowly opened them. And for the first time in his life, he looked upon the face of the one who loved him more than anybody else, his own mother. And he touched and kissed her face. And you can imagine by this time the, the tears of joy that are flowing down his mother's face. And then he had to run over to a window and look outside. And for the first time, he saw the green grass and the trees. And he saw a lake down below. And the sun was shining on the lake. And he saw ducks on that lake. And he turned to his mother and he said, he said, Mom, why didn't you tell me how beautiful it really was? And she said, I tried to tell you, but I didn't have the words. I wonder sometimes, when we get to heaven, do you think we might just say to John, John, why didn't you tell us how beautiful, how beautiful heaven really is? And he will say, I tried to tell you, but I didn't have the words. Heaven's a large place, plenty of room for all who are prepared to go there. Heaven is a beautiful place, but let me add this. Heaven is also a holy place. Revelation 21, 27, There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. A holy place. Will it not be wonderful to be in a place where we're never tempted to sin again? Now that's heaven. Not only that, we will no longer be surrounded by those we read about in verse 8 of Revelation 21. The abominable, the murderers, the homongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars. We have a world that is, that is going astray. A world that is filled with all kinds of evil. We read about it every day. We see it on the news every day. And we sometimes wonder, how long, how long, O oh Lord? But in this place called heaven, in this place called heaven, we shall be in a holy place for all of us will take on the character of the one who dwells there, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. I love the description of heaven. Now, I want to go to heaven not just because of its description, but because of the ones who will occupy heaven. Who will be in this place called heaven? Well, the divine Godhead makes its abode where? In this place called heaven. So God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit will be in heaven. Not only that, these heavenly messengers, his angels, they too will be there and they have worked on our behalf with regard to the salvation of our souls. Remember, they're coming with Jesus when he comes again. Not only that, I look forward to, to getting to know 
all of my great heroes from the Bible, don't you? I read God's Hall of Fame of Faith so often, and I thrill to know that those who are listed therein, I can know them one day. Many shall come from the east and from the west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob where in the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 8, 11. And therefore we learn from that passage that we shall know Abraham and we shall know Isaac and we shall know Jacob. And then we have people sometimes who say, well, we will not know one another in heaven. I don't know who came along and taught that, but it's just not biblical. One of the great blessings of heaven is to be reunited with our loved ones who've died in triumphant faith. If we can know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whom we've never met, and I guarantee you we're going to know each other when we get to heaven. And that's part of the joy of heaven, that great reunion day that's there in heaven. And so I want to go to heaven because I like its description. I like the occupants of heaven. Here's another reason. In heaven, there are no exits. There are no exits in hell, but in heaven, there are no exits. What does our Lord say? The righteous shall go into life eternal. Remember what Jesus said in a conversation with Nicodemus? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And you know what that tells me? That tells me that God never does tire of our company. That God desires our association throughout all eternity in this place called heaven. When you study great chapters like 1 Corinthians 15, you learn about that resurrection body that will be given to us on that great and final day, and I look forward to that. Paul would reiterate that to some extent when he wrote the second Corinthian letter, when he said, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day, verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 4. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Every one of us in this room, we're getting older, aren't we? Some of us are older than others, but we're all getting older. Now I want to tell you something. As I grow and develop in my relationship with Christ, the inner man gets better and better. It gets better and better. It's renewed day after day after day. I become more and more and more excited about serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet here's what's happening. The outward man is perishing. And it has been for a long time. And it's going to keep on perishing. But there is some time out there when the Lord says it's time to take that inner man that's being renewed day after day after day and put that inner man in something better than a physical body. What is that? It is that resurrection body, that body that will not decay, that body that is eternal in nature, even likened to our Lord's resurrected body. When will we receive that resurrection body on that great resurrection morning when our Lord Jesus Christ comes again? So think about what our Lord, what our Lord has to say concerning our becoming a Christian and follow Him. I mentioned just a moment ago, John 8, 21, except ye believe that I am He, Jesus said you'll die in your sins. But what if, what if we do believe in Him? Then we won't die in our sins. Jesus said, nay, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. But what if we do repent? Then we do not have to perish. He said, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. And he said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And so what our Lord made clear while he was here on earth is that we could go to heaven and he was the way. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He and he alone is the way to heaven. And we have this assurance that if we follow him, our eternity is secured. 
we will be in the place called heaven. I don't want to go to the place called hell. You don't either. We're a group of people here tonight that have our focus set on a heavenly prize and that heavenly prize is heaven. But if someone's here tonight who's never rendered obedience to the gospel, we're praying that this night at the end of this lecture series, you'll step out and come. Come to Jesus in his appointed way. Step out and obey the terms of the gospel so that not only your sins will be forgiven and not only will you be added to the body of the saved, which is the church, which is a secure place to be, but you will then have the hope of heaven dwelling within. Make sure tonight before we leave, every one of us looks on the inside and does some introspection and let's make sure that we're ready to meet Christ in judgment. For you see, however it is that we die, that's how we'll be judged. And however we are judged, that is what will determine where we spend eternity. Give serious consideration to that and respond accordingly as together we stand and sing.